All right, welcome to the AdaptX podcast, where we have individuals who are building accessible businesses, advocating for inclusion, or excelling in adaptive sports. Our intention is never to speak on behalf of those with disabilities, but provide a platform to share their voice and amplify their ideas to a more accessible world. Today, we are joined by Sean and Seamus Evans, a father and son duo from Galway, a small town in upstate New York. In addition to being a physical therapist, Sean is Senior Vice President of Programs with Ainsley's Angels of America. Uh, Seamus was born with cerebral palsy, which has resulted in him using a power wheelchair for mobility. Although Seamus may have some physical limitations, his ability to dream big is limitless. He and his father have run thousands of miles together and have participated in hundreds of races. The team has a passion for promoting inclusion and took on two transcontinental runs to spread awareness about inclu- inclusivity. This past Monday, they participated in their first Boston Marathon together, which I am excited to talk about more. So, Sean and Seamus, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having us. All right. Um, yeah, maybe we'll start with Boston because I think that will be like the um, the first topic that we'll probably promote since it's fresh in everyone's mind. So uh, maybe take us through the process of when did you first want to run Boston? Why did you want to run Boston? And how did you qualify to run Boston? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you say it's fresh, fresh in our minds. It's still fresh <laughs> in my legs, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I ran Boston for the first time in 2003 as an individual. Now, that was before Seamus uh, was even born. Seamus was born in 2006. Um, kind of like every every runner, you know, uh, not every, but a lot of runners have that as a goal to want to run Boston. And I was the same way when I was running as an individual. Um, I ran Boston six consecutive times through 2008. And then I started chasing faster times. I was looking for faster courses to run on. Um, ended up running a 226 marathon in Vermont City Marathon in 2009. Well, that was the fastest I ever got. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, um, Seamus had been training with me um, since he was basically old enough to sit in his jogging stroller. Uh, I guess that would have been 2007. He would have been a year old. Um, but in 2013, Seamus decided that he wanted to start running races together, uh, which I thought was a great idea. Um, we got some new wheels uh, that allowed for his growing body uh to, to uh, be more comfortable uh we got those from Ainsley's Angels and once Seamus got those new wheels we did start start racing together and I would say in the back of my mind at that time um you know knowing that Dick and Rick had done it 30 37 times or, or whatever it was um that hopefully Seamus and I would be able to get there someday I don't know um that Seamus knew about it at that time but but we ran our first marathon together uh, we ran an ultra marathon together in 2013, and I guess that was the, the the first time that we really covered a lot of distance. Do you remember specifically when Boston entered your um, mind? Oh, you know, you know what it probably was at the Louisiana Marathon in 2000, 2015. We had the opportunity to meet Dave McGilvery, who was mm-hmm. uh, the keynote speaker at the Louisiana Marathon, and um, he had found out that we were uh, getting ready and preparing for our trans our first trans content. At, continental run from seattle to new york city and of course dave had done the same thing in 1978 he ran from medford oregon to medford massachusetts um so there was a special place in his heart for uh what we were uh, getting ready to attempt and he brought us um each some boston marathon uh, apparel and presented us with that uh on stage uh as he delivered his keynote speech Um, and i would say that's probably when seamus was really introduced Mm -hmm. to boston yeah, so that was eight or nine years ago, and Seamus, at the time, you weren't old enough to run Boston, so there is the yeah. 18-year-old uh, minimum for riders as well, so you recently just turned 18, right? Yes. And that, that allowed you guys uh, the opportunity to do it, so you ran a qualifying race back in August or September? Yeah, you want to when, talk about when the was yeah. yeah, when was when, Sackets? Yeah, so that was Labor Day weekend in Sackets Harbor. And um, this was the first time that they were running the the race, so it was not um, there weren't too many people there, and which was good because um, going around people in big marathons is a bit of a challenge and can take up time. So when we're trying to qualify, uh, having that minimal uh, people there was a little bit helpful, and then. So uh, we started out really good. Uh, we had a great pace. And then around mile nine, our chair broke. The handlebar snapped clean off. 
and um, my dad had to push uh, the chair from way lower than uh, than where he usually was used to. So he ended up running the rest of the 17 miles from down low, and we still qualified with a time of 2:59. Yeah, that's awesome. Impressive feat for both of you, I'm sure. So it's actually it was looking at... because um because it was the first time they had run a marathon, I, I just reached out to the race director and explained who we were and what we were attempting to do and um they welcomed us with open arms and it, we were so grateful for that because originally we had planned to run the Buffalo Marathon and I did that I, I had registered for that uh because that was where I first qualified as an individual. I thought it would be neat to go back and qualify there as a team. Um, after I had reached out to the Buffalo race director, um, he had actually invited Seamus and I to be the keynote speakers for their dinner. And we were going to sign books at the, their expo. And then Seamus's Odyssey of the Mind team qualified for Worlds, the World Finals last year. So we had uh, we had to postpone our plans and change our plans. So I reached out to Sackett's Harbor kind of last minute, just a, maybe a six weeks before the race. And again, they welcomed us with open arms. So it all worked out really, really well. There's a qualifying window for Boston that ends like mid-September. And I only know because like the other night I was looking at what would qualify Jacob and I possibly for like 2025. And I think we have to run before September 15th or something. Right. Uh, right. So Sackett's, you said Sackett's is Labor Day weekend. Isn't Buffalo a little bit later in the fall? Uh, Buffalo is actually Memorial Day weekend. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So, so I, when been. when I was marathoning as an individual, I used to double. I used to do Boston, and then five or six weeks later, I would do Buffalo. Do Buffalo. Um, okay. But yeah, I, I mean, I'd recommend Sackett's Harbor. Definitely, it's it's an out and back course. Um, a little bit uphill on the way out, and and downhill on the way back. And um, yeah, I, I mean, it worked out really, really well for us. And the great thing about Sackett's Harbor, like you mentioned, there's that window for qualifying for Boston. Well, Sackett's Harbor falls in the window that qualifies you for two years. So if you're between the 1st and 15th of September, I think you get a two-year qualifier or, you know, whatever yeah. it is, 18 months. So so we yeah. are actually qualified at Sackett's Harbor for 2025 as well. No, perfect. Yeah, yeah, that works out perfectly. Uh, so maybe... We'll transition to Boston this year. Um, Seamus, what was your favorite part of the weekend? I guess I know you guys kind of came in late because you had a, a competition, so you didn't really get mm -hmm. there till Sunday. But maybe what yeah. was your favorite part of the uh, of, of the race? Uh, definitely the crowd. Um, with most marathons that I run, it feels like the time that it takes. But at Boston, with the crowd and all the energy and the positivity, it did not feel like we were out there for almost three hours. It went by very fast. Yeah, the crowds were crazy. Yeah. The crowds were insane. I Did actually almost found that... that... Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, one of the things that he said to me was, Dad, it feels like we're at the finish line of every other yeah. marathon the yeah. whole way. Yeah, exactly, the whole <laughs> way. Yeah, it was crazy. We couldn't hear any of the music on our chair. Usually we have a speaker mm -hmm. playing music. Couldn't hear any of it. <laughs> I almost uh, I almost felt like I was getting kind of propelled to running. I, I shouldn't say I almost felt. I definitely got propelled to running way faster than I wanted to because of the crowds. Uh, so it almost like was a – no, it certainly wasn't a negative, but it, it got me way thrown off for sure. <laughs> No doubt. I mean, that, that is the challenge of Boston always. Yeah. Um, the transcontinental runs that you guys have done, I know they've had a, a mission behind them. It's not just running an insane amount of miles. So uh, maybe could you take us through the two different uh, segments that you did and what you did along the way? Yeah. So I had mentioned earlier that, you know, Seamus and I ran that ultra marathon in 2013. Well, after that ultra marathon, Seamus came up with the idea that he'd like to run that far every single day for his summer vacation and in that ultra Precious. marathon it was, it, was a, it was a six hour <laughs> timed event and we had covered um 45 miles so he was like a fir in first grade at the time so my wife and i helped him with the math and said oh if we ran that far every single day for summer vacation we could run three thousand miles and he thought that, you know that that sounded neat and he said how far could we make it if we ran three thousand miles so we we pulled out a map of the united states and said we could run from this ocean to this ocean and pointed uh you know pacific to atlantic and it was like a little light bulb went off in seamus's head and, and he said we got to do that and my wife and i honestly kind of brushed it off at the time he was seven years old and um 
you know, it was fun. It was neat to dream about and think about, but we never actually thought that it would come to fruition. Um, and we would come up with, you know, reasons or excuses, <laughs> um, you know, like it's going to take a lot of time. I, I don't know if I can train or prepare my body for that. I don't even know if it's physically possible or financially possible and on and on. But uh, about three months later, Seamus was persisting. And when I was tucking him in reading after reading him his, his bedtime story, he said, Dad, when we run across America, can we can we donate chairs to kids like me? Can we can we gift them chairs so that they can feel what it's like to go fast and you know, I walked out of his room and, and said to my wife, we, we got to try. We got to try to make this happen. Um, so for the next 18 months, I trained in earnest and, and we planned and, and tried to figure out all the logistics. And in the summer of 2015, uh, we started, like I said, at, at Puget Sound in Seattle, Washington, and, and ran 56 miles a day for 60 consecutive days. And we donated 35 uh, Freedom Running chairs to kids and families along the way. All Seamus's idea. Nothing that was ever on my bucket list. <laughs> Seamus, great idea. Very, very kind <laughs> of, uh, very kind to your dad to uh, have him running that much. Um, what were the logistics of donating all those chairs? Were chapters kind of along the route meeting you guys, or were you transporting? Yeah, I mean, at, at that point, we didn't. We weren't as uh, Ainsley's Angels wasn't as wide reaching as it is now. In fact, a lot of our Ainsley's Angels ambassadorships, or at least a handful, were born out of that run across America. So what we did to um, solicit like applications for families was we reached out to um, I Run For, which is like a Facebook community of of people uh, that run for individuals with d disabilities or special needs. We took applications from them and we ended up with 35 applications. Um, the only caveat of the application was that they had to be able to get near or to the route that we were running. Uh, we got 35 applications and we were able to raise enough money to donate all 35 of those chairs. Yeah. Seamus, what was the most challenging part of that summer? So, um, on day six, uh, uh, there was a lot of negative stuff that happened. Um, we had, uh, we got a late start and, um, we had to present a chair live on TV. So having a, um, a late start from that, like not a bad reason to have a late start, but um, we made it to our destination a little bit later. And then um, there was a gas leak in the RV, which caused my mom to have a migraine. It was like a propane yeah. leak inside. Yeah. Mm. So she opened the, the vents. And then we were driving to, um, uh, like a party that they were throwing for us, a barbecue. And we forgot to close the vents. So a tree took the, the panel clean off. And, uh, my brother was going to make me a sandwich. Uh, and he cut his finger while he was doing that. So he was throwing up and passing out. And then, um... So we got to our party and we just had to decompress. And um, I I said to my family, "Why like why do you guys look so sad? We had a great we had a great day today. Mm -hmm. We got to donate a chair on TV. Um, we had, we got to do an interview. And um, after the barbecue, we were going to a water water park. So a lot of positive things." And I, so I think the hardest part was staying positive through the whole whole time. But um, when we, we were together as a family, you know, that was the pretty easy. Yeah. Sean, does that positivity from Seamus uh, translate to races as well? And how does it help your performance in races, especially when you meet adversary like Sackett's Harbor <laughs> or Boston when it's a challenging course in the later half? Yeah. I mean, Seamus is and, and has always been the eternal optimist. Um, I, and I personally am not always that way. I'm always, you know, running through scenarios of what could go wrong and, and what do I need to do to plan to try and avert that. Uh, but Seamus, you know, always kind of has the attitude that things are going to work out. And uh, he's always right. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You know, that positive, that positivity uh, definitely helps to propel us you know, through, through everything really, not, not just, not just racing, but every day, you know, we, we run into obstacles 
we have run into challenges, but, you know, I think about some of the obstacles and challenges that Seamus faces on a daily basis and that we're able to um, work together as a team to, to overcome that. And uh, I, maybe that's kind of the reason that he has the attitude he does um, of, of positivity. Uh, so, so no doubt, I mean, when the, the handle, when the, the chair broke in Sackett's Harbor, it wasn't even a question about stopping. It was, you know, how, how are we going to make this work so that we can continue to try and meet our qualifying time? Um, and we did have to make some adjustments, you know, I couldn't turn the chair, um, because I had no leverage, like we normally, you know, pop a wheelie and turn. And we had hairpin turns because it was an out and back. So I ran around to the front of the chair, lifted up the front tire and, and dragged them behind me when I needed to. And there were several turns that we had to do that on. And, and again, we still met the qualifying standard. Seamus um, kept his smile the entire time. And, and I'm sure that that <laughs> that helped me to stay positive. Yeah, it was a great article in Runner's World about it. We'll have to link it in the show notes of the episode so people can read about the Sackets Harbor experience. But uh, Seamus, have you guys had any races where the conditions, like weather-wise, uh, were less than ideal? And, and how, how does it feel? That was my biggest fear with Boston was it was going to yeah. be cold and raining just for Jacob's sake, like getting pelted mm -hmm. with rain for three or four hours. What is the worst race experience that you've had weather-wise? Three years ago, I don't know which one are you thinking. Marine Corps. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So about three years ago, um, we were running Marine Corps, and um, we said, you know, this was probably going to be our last um, last Marine Corps as I was entering high school, and the weather for that was about probably 40 degrees and cold cold downpours of rain just not fun the chair was filling with water so anytime we would tip to turn all the water would rush to to like the back where i was sitting so that that was not very comfortable and after the race i said we could not end on that year that was not a uh, good enough weather to end so we ended up continue to do do marine course yeah there were parts of that race where we were running through eight inches and i'm not exaggerating eight right. inches wow. of standing water on the road um it's just probably the, the most challenging weather that we've ever run yeah. in just because it, it was relentless rain um i had put seamus's feet in like a, a bag, uh, like a plastic bag to try and keep them dry. When we finished the race, I dumped about two gallons of water out of that bag. That's crazy. Um, there was no, no staying dry. Um, since then we've gotten a nice little rain shield, uh, that is a little more tight fitting and, and fits the chair a little better. So if we encounter those, those type of conditions again, we'll, we'll be a little better prepared. Uh, you guys have done a lot of races and kind of all around the country uh, what marathon or shorter distance, I suppose as well, uh, race would you say is the most inclusive or what, what do you notice about some races that are more inclusive than others? What makes them more inclusive? Did you have a thought off the top of your head? No. I would say, I mean, I would say Marine Corps marathon seems to be one of the more inclusive races, uh, that, that we participated in just because of the number of wheels on the course and the way that they take care of the, the wheeled athletes, um, you know, we're, we're amongst the start. I think, I think there's like a hundred duos usually, uh, which is, you know, unique. Uh, and then a lot of hand crank and uh, push rim. And of course there's a lot of veterans involved in that race. Um, so that, I would say that's probably one of the most inclusive that we've ever been a part of. And that, uh, that takes place right around Halloween weekend every year in Washington, DC. Yeah, and I mean, this year we were a part of the biggest duo field that Boston's ever had. Um, right. But obviously, I would love to see them continue to expand that division. Because uh, hey. I feel like, I mean, if you can accommodate 20, I'm not sure why you couldn't accommodate 30. Yeah, um, and you look at Marine so. Corps Marathon, and I think that, you know, the total field is something like 40,000. And, you know, like I said, 100 duos and probably as many um, hand cranks um, mm -hmm. all, all on the course together sharing the road. So. What is um? What's the line between competing as a duo and advocating as a duo? Like, is there is there a downside of wanting to run well, or are we supposed to just be content with being out there and showcasing inclusion? You know, I think that 
you know, even coming out of Boston and us having a surprisingly good, uh, faster time than I expected, um, just helps with, you know, publicity for what we do. Um, so I, I think the two can go hand in hand. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't just have to be that we're going out to, uh, participate though. I, though I think that is our number one goal is going out to participate. But yeah. then when you do it with a little bit of, um, competitive spirit and, and a little bit of, you know, pace, um, it draws a little more attention. And, and like, you, you know, you mentioned the runner's world article, um, you know, Seamus and I were driving home from, uh, the race on Monday. And I think we did three interviews on the car ride home through, mm -hmm. through the van speaker phone. Um, just because, uh, you know, people have heard of, of what we have done as a duo, what we've accomplished as a family. Um, and I think that it does help a little bit to, to be able to still run yeah. rely on Seamus yeah. to pull me a little faster once in a while. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it certainly doesn't diminish the accomplishments of anyone that's not competing for a specific time. Exactly. Uh, it's still, it's still equally essential, but I do think you're right that it turns a little more heads and, um, hopefully like even, even at Boston, like there's prize purses for every division except duos. So like maybe, right. Maybe it will get to a point where duos are recognized in the same lens that push rim or hand cycle uh, is, and it probably would require people like yourselves uh, kind of moving that forward as a more competitive field. Yeah, yeah. I thought the same thing um, as we were driving home on Monday. You know, the other thing that, that um, obviously has helped a lot is Dick and Rick's longevity um, in doing it, and, and hopefully Seamus and I are able to to maintain that as a, as a father-son duo um you know that it's just astounding how long they were able to do it for um, yeah. and then you know when i have to retire maybe seamus's brother can step in and, and continue uh, yeah, seamus being able to to participate yeah yeah that would be awesome i mean my favorite part of what you've shared so far is just the uh closeness of your family even like a a summer being spent running living in an rv like that's that's just uh really impressive to me so I think my favorite part of the whole story is just how close you guys are. Um, and honestly, and I, you know, that was one of the hardest parts of Monday was that Nicole and Simon couldn't be there. It, it, you know, they had obligations back here, Simon with track practice and Nicole with school that they just, they didn't feel like they could step away from it. And I, we totally understood it, but it was hard to not have them at uh, a race like Boston, you know, when they, yeah. they are, are by our sides or, or cheering us on um, as much as possible. And, and, you know, you mentioned that summer of 2015, those are some of my most favorite memories. Um, yeah, it was amazing. We saw some amazing, amazing things and, and ran across the country, but honestly, some of my most favorite memories are time in the RV, just the four of us, you know, out on the road, um, you know, visiting around that tiny little table at, at dinner or playing, playing games at Uno or whatever. Um, I'm going to cherish those memories forever. Yeah, absolutely. I can't imagine that your favorite part of that experience was running uh, nearly 60 miles a day. I can't, can't imagine that was the most comfortable part of the experience. But um, Seamus, what are your goals for the next few years, maybe both academically and athletically? Yeah, so um, coming up pretty pretty soon, I'm uh, hosting a Blue Jean Mile at my school to raise awareness for um, mental illness and suicide awareness. So that is where people will come to our high school track. They'll throw on a pair of blue jeans and run a mile. Um, and then I'll, I'll give them a, a... Everyone will get an award of some sort. And then uh, after that, um, starting to get ready for college, I have recently committed to U UAlbany uh, and to study uh, physics and mechanical engineering. Really impressive. Is you Albany close to where you guys live? Yeah, it's about like forty five minutes away. But Seamus's awesome. goal is to go and, and live on campus, and that's mm -hmm. what we're trying to navigate as a family now. Is uh, you know we've been working with uh, the residents' life and disability uh, services, and, and they're all on board. Now it's just a matter of finding the the personal care assistance that that will be able to help him. Yeah. Why don't absolutely. you tell them about some of the other uh, athletic things that you do in general, and, and hope to continue? Oh yeah, yeah. So um. Yeah, one of the one of the big ones is right now I'm shooting trap currently, and um, we have uh, two competitions coming up that I'm going to, and hopefully uh, 
can uh, do pretty well in. And then yeah. over the summer, I will be a part of the Why Not Sailing Club at Lake George. And last year, I won the the regatta that they uh, hosted. So hopefully this year I can um, participate in that again. So one of the, and one of the really neat things about that program, again, it's called Why Not, um, is Seamus can totally sail independently. Now, I, I didn't know anything about sailing, but Seamus, they have the, the boats rigged. They're for people with disabilities. They have a joystick that operates the rudder and the, the pulleys for the rope so he can operate the sails. Um, and Seamus has been sailing since he was 12 years old. Um, I hopped in the boat with him because they were short volunteers one day this summer. And Seamus has us like sideways at a 45 degree angle. And I'm like, Seamus, is this, is this what we're supposed to be doing? And we were <laughs> flying with the wind and, uh, that was awesome. it was just amazing. Um, so the thing that's neat about that is he, you know, he doesn't have to rely on my legs to propel him, uh, and he can do it solo. It's really, really been rewarding to watch. Yeah, absolutely. Sean, as, um, as a father, maybe uh 18 years ago when you found out that Seamus was going to have cerebral palsy um what were your initial reactions and how uh has what he's accomplished over the last 18 years um likely vastly exceeded all of your expectations i would imagine yeah uh, you know it's it's interesting because Seamus wasn't diagnosed with cerebral palsy at birth um, he was, you know, as far as the, the doctors in the hospital and everything were concerned was he, you know, he was born a uh, healthy baby. His APGAR scores are normal. There was no, uh, you know, trauma or anything that you often hear about with cerebral palsy. Um, I, my job at the time was pediatric physical therapy. And that's all I was doing, uh, working primarily with individuals with neurological conditions similar or, or having cerebral palsy. Um, so I actually took it to the doctor several times and I said, I think, you know, some of the things that Seamus is exhibiting, you know, he was holding his hands in tight little fists. He had ankle clonus, which is kind of that, you know, beating um, of his ankles. Um, there were there was just a, a few different things that I took to the doctors and they, they just said, Sean, you, you're just paranoid dad who knows too much. He's going to outgrow it. You know, there's 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 nothing really to be concerned about here. Finally, when he was about 10 months old and wasn't really sitting or crawling or anything, uh, they agreed to an early intervention evaluation. He obviously qualified because he had developmental delay. And then about two months later that right later than that, right around his um, first birthday is when we saw a neurologist and he was actually diagnosed with cerebral palsy. So your question was, you know, how did you how did you feel or how did you react? And I think I had known that it was coming for a long time um, and my wife you know, and I had, had obviously had a lot of conversations about it. And, and Nicole at the time was a special education teacher. So, um, we were well versed in what services, um, were available and, and how to navigate that system. And, and without ever really talking about it, you know, N Nicole and I, you know, set the plan in progress to whatever Seamus wants to try or do, we're going to figure out a way to make that happen through how, you know, however we have to accommodate, adapt, um, and make things accessible. And that's what we've done, uh, his entire life. And then, you know, he asked how, how <laughs> kind of Seamus's last 18 years have turned out. Now, again, my goal was to get him involved and then to participate in whatever he wanted to do. I had no idea that he was going to bring our family on the journey that we've been on. I mean, I, I, again, beyond my wildest dreams, I had no idea that he was going to be such a, a big dreamer and such a positive um, beam of light in this family um, and really has, has led the way. And, and a lot of times I say, you know, I'm just here riding Seamus's coattails and, and helping to put his, his mission into being. And, and re he has really helped us to uh, figure out and see what inclusion is all about. Yeah. And now you guys are very involved with Ainsley's Angels, which is an organization that does something similar for a lot of families around the country. Um, Seamus, do you want to tell the audience a little bit about what Ainsley's Angels is? Yep. So Ainsley's Angels is a rider athlete organization, and they'll pair um, able-bodied runners with our rider athletes and participate in endurance events like 5Ks, marathons, ultra marathons, and then um, 
some people have even done triathlons, which is a, re a really cool experience. Are you guys going to do any triathlons or have you done any triathlons? We, we have, uh, we've yeah, done yeah. three or four. Yeah. Yeah. We've done several. Three. Um, and the neat thing about Ainsley's Angels, and I know, I know you know, Brendan, is we're really trying to branch out even just beyond race day and figuring out how we can bring inclusion to every day, you know, through our ally development program and um, more inclusion experiences beyond race day, whether that be, you know, a, an outing or a, a, you know, sensory friendly movie nights or whatever. We just um, want everybody to be uh, able to be included and involved in, in whatever they want to try. Yeah. Can you maybe just elaborate a little bit on what that Allied Development Program is? Yeah. So uh, launched uh, last November, uh, our Allied Development Program is geared at creating disability allies, uh, people that can help to promote inclusion, disability awareness, and disability acceptance in their local communities. And, and that's what the program is geared toward educating them on and uh, the goal of the program is for each individual in the cohort to create uh, a community inclusion project that addresses a need in their local community wh whether it be you know an accessible playground or adult size changing tables in the in the restroom or um, accessible entrances to businesses uh, um, whatever it is uh, and and they're working on those projects now and they'll be presenting them uh up here in june yeah i love that and some of the i've stayed in contact with a few of the people that i met uh from boston when i came up to speak to that group but um i love how comprehensive it is right so racing is important racing showcases inclusion but there's a lot more to getting your community involved and uh making your community more inclusive and accessible so i think that program kind of bridges that gap really nicely thank you what is uh what's next for you guys do you have plans for next races yeah why don't you tell them about what you're doing mm. well i mean we have we have a couple short races here and we will yeah. run with our local ambassadorship here all spring and summer uh before yeah. uh seamus heads off to college but seamus we have uh, yeah. some big plans for the fall yeah so in october we're going to be running the marine corps marathon again um but this time i won't be running with my dad He's going to be pushing our friend, Jill, and um, my friend, my friend, John, who's also an A6 ambassador, is going to be pushing me in his first marathon ever. Mm -hmm. So exactly. it'll be really fun to um, see how he uh, feels about that experience, not only it being his first marathon, but his first time pushing someone. Yeah, absolutely. Um is that the first time that someone other than your dad has pushed you in a race? Uh, not not first maybe a time, marathon. But marathon, yes. Yeah, yep. Yeah, because because I I I think about that sometimes. Where like, um, for example, like I we host a five k for my gym, um, and mm -hmm. so instead of, instead of running, I'm organizing the race. So Jacob doesn't participate because I'm not running. And I, I sometimes wonder if, like, if I would want someone else pushing him. I don't know. To me, it feels like uh, something that him and I do together. Like, it right, feels yeah. like a special thing that him and I do together. So was there any part of you that was, like, hesitant to let someone else push Seamus? Or? There's, been a few, uh, there's been a few situations. One, you know, like, he ran the, uh, a mother love and run 5K with my wife one time, which was really neat, and, and a group yeah. of her friends. Um, He's run a couple races with me and Simon, with Simon, his brother, doing the bulk of the pushing. Again, that's all family stuff. But then we went down and ran the Louisiana Marathon in, uh, uh, it might have been like 2017 or 18, and one of his friends pushed him in the half marathon down there with a group of adults that were there to assist as needed. Uh, so there's been a couple, um, you know, individual unique opportunities, but I, I, I tend to be the same way, you know. I like having Seamus to lean on and, and that smile to pull me along. And I have not really run a race other than a couple trail races when I was training for the run across America. I haven't run a race without Seamus since 2012 or 2011 yeah. or something. It's been a long time. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I've never raced without Jacob and I never had raced before Jacob and I started running together. So uh, it's something that just, I guess that, uniqueness makes it feel a little more personal oh, like yeah. no uh, like i don't i don't think i would ever want to push someone else uh and i'm not sure selfishly whether i would 
want someone outside of my wife to push Jacob. Uh, she's pushed right. him in like our local 5K and stuff. But yeah. um, it, it just does feel like some sort of special uh, bond that we've come. And I often tell my coach that I'm faster with the chair than I am without. And maybe that's because I don't have any running experience or maybe it is a biomechanics thing. But like for you, do you feel like it's a lot harder to run fast with the chair? Or I mean, I think over this, Seamus and I have now been run, running together for, I mean, for, for longer, but racing together for 11 years. And I think that, you know, I just have kind of evolved into, you know, how to master running with the chair. I don't feel like I need my arms anymore. And I do a lot of running without the chair, too, because I, I run with his brother, Simon, um, and we train together. Um, but as far as racing with the chair, like in Boston on Monday, I was glad I had mm -hmm. the chair. <laughs> yeah absolutely and maybe like i i kind of glanced over it quickly but um in boston i guess how how did you feel like the course was with the chair or how do you feel like running it was well do you want to, i mean i had told brendan we were gonna go out at seven minute pace yeah. and I, I was yeah, not you lying lied to that me. was my you lied, to, you lied to me i turned <laughs> with the gun the gun goes off and you already had like a 20 second lead on all of us what you you must have i split 540 for the first mile so you must have been 515 or 520 uh because yeah. you were a good you were a good 15 or 20 seconds ahead of us <laughs> you want to talk about those first few yeah. miles Jay? <laughs> so, so when the gun goes off and we start out sprinting yeah. and uh, you know my dad had told me his plan and i'm like i don't know mm. how closely we're sticking to the plan <laughs> and then we get about five miles in and i get a text from my mom saying what the heck i thought you guys were sticking with six minutes tell, you, tell your dad to to save some that's for heartbreak hill funny. so I, I read him that text and then he uh reined it in a little bit and um we stuck to the plan of going slow easy on the uphills cranked it on the downhills and then but through that plan, we were able to get our PR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, was, I mean, uh, as far as the, I was no, just go gonna ahead. say, as far as the the course goes, as far as the course goes, um, you know, I forgot how undulating Boston was, and I had run it six times, but it's been fifteen years since I last ran it. Um, and those undulating hills, that's what beats you up, though, you know, because you're down and then you're up and then you're down, uh, and it's like what we train in all the time. Um, but it, you know, that's why my legs are so sore today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm still feeling the ramifications as well. But yeah, it was um, it was something where like I just could not really slow down the first half. And I'm getting texts. We have kind of our phone mounted on the on the arrow bars. Um, I'm getting texts like, oh, you're crushing it. I'm like, no, like, this is not good. Like, this is not what I wanted. They're like, you're doing great. Uh, and I'm like, uh, it's not going to end well. But um, knew it was coming um my only disappointment is that like i was cramping so bad by 17 that i like couldn't really run up the hills um but i actually didn't think the newton hills were that intimidating uh there's a lot of like reprieves where you go uphill but then you're kind of running on a flat or a downhill for a little bit of time so they didn't feel quite as unrelenting as um as you may think I don't know. Yeah, Maybe and the last opinion. one is really where I felt it, and that was just you know the the cumulative effect of everything that we had done. But as soon as we got to the top, you know, I kind of shook my arm, shook my legs out, and um, we were we were right back into it. In fact, um, Simon was tracking us from physics class, <laughs> <laughs> um, and he said, oh, "Dad, I saw that you had this one mile that was nine oh six, and he was worried. You know, he figured that I had cramped up right. or that we were going to struggle from there on." And then he said, but the next mile was 6.08. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so we, yeah. And, it was, and it was good. And like you said, that reprieve, and, and uh, it allows you to use some different muscles. Um, and for me, it allowed me to lean on Seamus and let him do the work on the downhills. As long as my stride could go, I tried to let it go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely different running with the chair. Uh, it's probably a, a type of stride that you adopt to, um, kind of like get used to over time for sure but um you guys have a lot of great resources uh you have a book that you guys wrote together right um if people are interested in purchasing that or learning more about your story as a whole is there a specific website or channel that we should direct them to 
Yeah, I mean, if people want to follow what Seamus is up to or what Seamus and I are up to, our, our Instagram, Facebook um, pages are power to push. That's power, the number two, and then push. Um, and then as far as like ordering the book, it is available on Amazon. Um, but we prefer that everybody order from ainsleysangels.org. Uh, it's the exact same price. Um, it's free shipping in both places. Um, but, but that way, Ainsley's Angels gets a little more of the profits. Uh, all the money for the the sales of the books goes toward uh, benefiting Ainsley's Angels and the, promoting the the mission of inclusion. Um, and you know, eventually, a goal of ours is to. So that book primarily I wrote alone, but Seamus and I do have the goal of writing a book together where I think it would be neat to kind of alternate chapters. So we'll see how his schedule allows us to do something like that. But that would be, I think, pretty neat in the future. Yeah, I'm sure you'll have a lot of free time with your physics and uh, mechanical engineering <laughs> yeah. uh, workload as well to write a book. It sounds <laughs> sounds perfect. But um, yeah, we can we'll include some of those links in the show notes so people can easily find them. Uh, and maybe lastly, if like someone wants to get involved with Ainsley's Angels, uh, and if there isn't a chapter already in their community, uh, what would be the process of them starting one? Oh, yeah, that, I really appreciate that question. Uh, you know, Ainsley'sAngels.org is the place to go and then click join our family. Uh, if there is a location in your area and we, we are in, uh, you know, between 60 and 70 cities and towns across America. And um, if, but if we're not in your local uh area or region, um, there's an opportunity to uh, become an ambassador. Uh, and we take uh, any any interested individuals, you know, through an application process, and then, uh, again, provide the education, so that it's not such a daunting task uh, to to be able to start and, and develop and, and create a thriving ambassadorship in their area. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, so we'll include all those uh, links so people can easily find them. Um, but Sean, Seamus, thanks for Thanks for the conversation. Congratulations on Boston. I know it was a long journey to get there uh, and a great day, hopefully. Um, you guys ran really well. Appreciate everything you guys do uh, for the world of inclusion and uh, inclusive endurance sports as a whole. So, no, oh, thanks. Thank and, and likewise to you, too, all that you do. Um, and again, the cohort has reached out to me a lot of times, uh, you know, said that they've been listening to your, your lectures and your <laughs> podcast uh, and everything that you do. Um, so we really appreciate it. I hope that we can keep okay. that, that relationship going for future cohorts and that you uh, will continue to be involved because uh, it yeah. means a lot. Yeah, you might, you might catch us up in Sackett's Harbor as a uh, last ditch effort of uh, making it into Boston again next oh, year. Yeah, so. if, yeah, if you're interested in going to Sackett's Harbor, um, I, I can put you in touch with the race director. So the Sackett's Harbor race director also ran Boston on Monday. You, um, were, you were talking to him, right? I, I think I saw... Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys talking to him before or after the race. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. She uh, she's incredible, and, and I'm sure they would love to have another duo. Seamus and I won't be there this year in Sackett's Harbor uh, because he'll at be school. you know at, at school. Oh, yeah. um, but if you guys go up, um, maybe Simon and I will go up and run the half marathon or something okay. and cheer you on. That'd be really I cool. Do. So let me know. All right. Wonderful. I will. Thanks again, guys. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Right, take it easy, brother. Bye.